All right, our next speaker is uh, Judge Mark Goldsmith, who is the um, who is a uh, United States District Court judge nominated by the President and the Senate in 2010. Um, and Judge Goldsmith, who is also a chassam, will, uh, I'm not sure if he's going to give us a speech or a cantorial rendition, but will share a few words with us. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. No singing, this will just be a few words. Einstein uh, taught us in his theory of relativity that time is not constant, it's a variable. It depends on the relative velocity of the observer. It's kind of an esoteric idea. The physicists among us will understand that far better than we will. But it actually has a counterpart in our everyday existence. I was listening to a report on the radio that talked about how as we age, time actually accelerates. That is to say, we perceive it to accelerate. Time begins to fly by faster and faster. And there's actually a reason for that, a physiological reason. Our brain becomes habituated to experiences of a routine nature. And like someone going through an old photograph album book who sees the same pictures he's looked at over and over again, you flip through it faster and faster, your brain processes your everyday experiences faster and faster, and time speeds up. So if you've ever thought about Arab Shabbos, oh my gosh, it's Shabbos already? That's exactly the phenomenon that I'm talking about. Well, this report didn't have any suggestions about how you might counteract that acceleration of time. But actually, Judaism does offer a solution. Judaism offers speed bumps that helps us de-accelerate time. We're about to run into a speed bump in just a few weeks. It's called Rosh Hashanah. And then 10 days after that, we're going to run into another speed bump. It's called Yom Kippur. Now, these two holy days are speed bumps because they're very different than any other holy days that we celebrate during the Jewish calendar. How so? Well, the other holy days that we celebrate are historically based. Pesach looks back to our liberation from Egypt. Shavuos celebrates our being at Sinai and seeing the Torah given to us. And Sukkot commemorates how God caused us to dwell in booths in the desert. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur really have no historical perspective to them at all. We focus on the here and now. We're not looking back to some period in history in our people. That's a big speed bump right down there. It's not historical. It's happening right now. There's another big difference. Our other holy days all have to do with rituals that we perform. Pesach Seder, building a sukkah, staying up all night on Shavuos to study Torah, and to eat plenty of blintzes the next morning. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there are no personal rituals like that. Yes, we will blow the shofar and shul, but that's about it. There's nothing to operate on these coming days except our minds. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are speed bumps because everything that goes on is of an interior nature. It's literally all in our heads. And we also ask ourselves to do something on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur that we don't do on any of the other holy days. 
Our mission on Pesach and Shavuos and Sukkot is to do what? Samachta v'chagecha. You're supposed to be happy. That's not really our job on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. On these speed bump days, we're supposed to pause and engage in the deepest kind of introspection that we can during the course of the Jewish year. And when you look at the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, the interior questions that we ask are of the most profound kind. Ma'anu, what are we? Ma'chayinu, what is our life? Ma'chazdenu, what is our sense of graciousness? Ma'tit kotena, what's, what's our righteousness? Ma'kocheinu, what are our strengths? Ma'gaborotenu, in what way are we heroic? Is what we do just hevel? Is it vanity? Or is it something more lasting than that? We don't ask those kinds of questions any other time of the year. Not on Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, or even the most profound day of the Jewish year, Shabbat. We don't ask those interior questions. Those questions are pretty hard to answer, and maybe it's a good thing that we don't ask them too many times during the course of the year. But we do have to ask those questions. And then the question is, well, how do we get to an answer? Fortunately, there's a book that's been written. It's called The Book of Answer. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Hilchot Teshuva. Teshuva is normally translated as repentance. Some people call it returning. It's actually, it means answer, Teshuva. Shela, Teshuva. Teshuva is the Teshuva. Answering is the repentance. Answering is the return. So what's the answer? Look in the book of Teshuvah, Hilchot Teshuvah, written by Rambam, Maimonides, the towering sage of Jewish thought. And here's his answer. Analytically, very simple. In application, very complicated. To answer the questions that we just posed, you simply say this. Imagine the world is half Guilty and half not guilty. Half of it is righteous, half of it is not righteous. And you look at your own world. See yourself as half guilty and half not guilty. Half righteous and half righteous. And then look at your very next step. What you do is going to end up tipping the balance for you but not just for you, for you and the rest of the world. That's how you answer the questions, ma'anu, ma'chayinu, ma'chasdenu. Who are we? What's our life? What's our sense of graciousness? Story to illustrate. We have to go back about 30 years it's on a windswept hill in Yerushalayim. There's an elementary school. A young principal and her co-teacher are getting ready for the school day. They hear a sound outside. The young teacher says, I think that's a cat. But the principal says, it's not a cat. It's a baby crying. The teacher says, no, 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 it's a cat. The principal says, I'm telling you, that's a baby. Let's go investigate. And so they go outside, and sure enough, a scene right out of the book of Exodus, a basket with a little baby boy in it. The little note. Please take care of this baby. 
They called the police who conduct an investigation, but they cannot locate the parents of this child. The baby was wrapped in a blanket that appeared to be similar to the kinds of blankets used at the nearby Hebrew University dormitory for overseas students. So the police suspected that a young woman had this baby, was not able or willing to keep it, and she left it on this hillside in Yerushalayim. Police, of course, took charge of the baby. The baby was placed for adoption. Strange story. Sad story. 30 years later, the principal gets a phone call. Man asks her whether she was at such and such a school in such and such a year in Jerusalem. She said, yes. Were you the principal? Yes. Did you find a baby on that day? Out there in Jerusalem on the hillside? Yes. Well, I'm that baby. And I'd like to see you. So this young man comes over to the principal's home and tells her what has happened in the last 30 years. He was raised by religious parents, established a home in B'nai Brak in Israel. He married and he had two children of his own. And he wanted to come back and thank the person who had saved his life. Ma'anu, ma'chayenu, what are we? What's our life? What's our sense of graciousness? What's our heroism? The world was evenly divided at that point. If the principal had said, yeah, maybe it is a cat, and had gone on with her day, that little baby boy might not have survived. And his two little children may never have been brought into the world as well. When this Israeli principal was asked, what brought you to Eretz Israel? She was an immigrant from America. She said, well, I was raised in a very Jewish home. We kept kosher, we kept Shabbos. Went to Hebrew school. But what she pointed to was one thing in particular that brought her to Eretz Israel. It was her bubby. Her grandmother had taken her in the 1940s to a women's meeting of Women's Mizrahi, a group that was dedicated to preserving and promoting, perpetuating Jewish life in the land of Israel. And this little girl, at that time, couldn't have been more than five, six, seven, was fascinated that these women were so concerned about this little strip of land thousands of miles away that she only knew through stories that she had read at Hebrew school. That's what led her to the land of Israel. What prompted her bubby to schlep her along to a Mizrahi meeting? Not clear. But that one decision was probably the decision the world was half guilty and it was half innocent. And she made a decision to take her along. And as a result, that little grandchild ended up growing up, moving to Israel, becoming a principal in Jerusalem, and saving that little baby's boy. That little baby boy. And that boy's children. to know this story well because that principal is my sister and her bobby is my bobby or was my bobby my sister took and still takes her life seriously my bobby did too they really followed the Rambam's formula they looked at everything that they did 
and looked at the world as half innocent, half guilty, looked at their own lives as half innocent, half guilty, and understood that everything that they did could end up tipping the balance in favor of saving the world or not. And remember, according to the rabbis, if you save one life, you've saved an entire world. So, as I look forward to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, these speed bumps that God has given us, that's how I think we can deal with these very profound questions of ma'anu, ma'chayenu. Who are we? What are we? And what is our life really all about? Any one thing that we do could end up deciding the fate of the world. That's a very quintessential Jewish concept. Anything from lighting Shabbos candles, to giving tzedakah, to schlepping a little child to a Jewish organizational meeting. Everything we do could end up deciding the fate of the world. That's how we take life seriously in Jewish thinking. So I wish you all a Shana Tovah. May you have a happy and healthy New Year and a thoughtful New Year as well.